So here we have another illuminated manuscript, which is something I defined a few pieces ago. Uh, so the same definition applies to this one too. So go back and look at that if you need a definition of illuminated manuscript. Uh, this Lindisfarne Gospels, we're going to start off basically discussing context again. I'm usually going to start off with context. And Lindisfarne, which again is part of the title, is an island off of the coast of England, like northern England. And there was an island there. And this was a site of a monastery where this piece was made and housed for a while. It ultimately was a pilgrimage site. Now, pilgrimage is like a journey, usually a religious journey that you're going to take uh, to visit a place that is sacred, uh, a place that has important objects or associations in your faith. And usually pilgrimage sites are going to have some kind of healing properties or you know, a, a sacred experience that enriches you in some way. Or it is your obligation, perhaps, in your faith to take this um, pilgrimage. So this is a pilgrimage site because of a saint that was um, buried here. And I put the name on the screen. You can see it highlighted in the center. It's St. Cuthbert. He is the, the person who uh, died here. And the book was made for him basically. And his remains and the objects associated with him were thought to have healing powers. So the monks who lived in this monastery in Lindisfarne produced this book and read from it during rituals for St. Cuthbert, who died. And uh, people would come to visit, again, the site because they believed St. Cuthbert and his relics or the objects in his, you know, his presence there would help heal them or, you know, provide some kind of um, positive impact in their life. So a lot of people made the journey to that place. Now the, the piece was made by a monk and you will see that in your identification. The monk's name is Bishop Eid Frith. So check out that on your ID. And we think he illustrated this text. It took him probably about six years to do that. Um, so again, books are very important to a monastery or a church. They're very sacred items, they're luxury items, and this is no exception. This would probably be the only book in this monastery. And it was so, it was, imagine it covered all these pages of calf skin or animal skin that were painted on were covered in a jeweled cover, some kind of important like semi-precious stones or precious stones. So they were extremely valuable to other groups. In this case, the Vikings uh, from Norway uh, came in and attacked the monastery in like the late 790s, so the later eighth century. And uh, luckily, some of the monks got the Gospels, this book, this illuminated manuscript, and moved it to a place south, about 75 miles away uh, from where it was made in Lindisfarne, and, served, and the book survived uh, this attack from the monastery. A lot of times the Vikings or any kind of group would take the books, rip off these valuable covers, and just throw the pages away. Um, so that is part of the history and context here. Now, another thing, two things, actually. There's a vocab term you see, and you can put that in context. Luminated manuscripts typically were made in a room in a monastery. And this room was called a scriptorium. So that, again, is a term to put in your context. And then the other thing to talk about here are, you know, you can see in front of you these rich, vibrant colors these oftentimes were uh, achieved through materials that were used you know, in the pigments. These materials were very um, luxurious. So in fact, they had, these monks had gotten a lapis lazuli material from the Himalayas. So you know, 
much further east uh, from where we are here in, in northern England and use this lapis lazuli, ground it up to make the brilliant blue color. So the materials are quite rare, hard to get, uh, luxurious, and the time, effort, and skill is also incredibly involved in making this, just heightening the fact that this piece is incredibly important. Now, there are three pages to the Lindisfarne Gospels that you have to be, oops, sorry, aware of. This is the first. So this is what's called the cross carpet page, and it's from um, part of it called the St. Matthew um, book. So actually, before we get into that, let's, let's transition now. We're going up to content. And the first thing you want to write down in content is the term gospels. And the gospels translates to, and it says it on the screen, the bringers of good news. So in terms of our piece, you know, the, the um, illuminated manuscript is basically the gospels, which are the first four books of the New Testament. And each gospel is written by one of the, what we call the evangelists. So they are the writers of this good news or writers of the gospels. And their names are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that is all on the screen. So this particular page, this cross carpet page, was at the beginning of the Gospel of St. Matthew. And so this would introduce that gospel to the, um, the reader or the person who is looking at this text. So a carpet page, if you just look at the image, it should look and remind you of like a rug something really ornamental and designed, a lot of detail, and that's why it is called a carpet page. The cross part of it is just the cross that you see in this piece. So really what I would say content-wise for the cross carpet page is that you have a repetition of you know, the design and the pattern. You have a lot of spiraling, elongated shapes or knots that they're called. And if we, I'm gonna go back to here for a second. If you look on the right hand side, you can see them close up. It's actually a collection of spiraling serpents or like snake-like figures. And they are intertwined together. It's such a common like middle ages um, design pattern to see this intricacy of the painting that you have and the repetition of the colors, the spirals and the lines in this carpet page, it kind of is supposed to, in, it's intended to kind of make you feel almost entranced or like hallucinating or a more appropriate term probably is meditative. That you look at this and it's just trying to kind of take your mind on a journey and it would be a spiritual journey. And the thing that is a stabilizing force in this meditative, prayerful like mindset you are having by looking at it, the stabilizing force is the cross. Notice that the cross is defined by those red thick lines. It stops that movement of your eye and of your mind and then continues it on inside the cross with that spiraling, intertwining, weaving kind of shapes. So really it, this cross carpet page is an introduction page, kind of gets you in the mindset. It helps to meditate, pray, um, and oftentimes we'll have, as a lot of Middle Ages art will have, these stylized patterns that are made mostly with zoomorphic forms, these animal forms that we've talked about in the past. So that's the St. Matthew cross carpet page of the Lindisfarne Gospels. Now, moving on, you also are responsible to know the St. Luke portrait page. It's a much different looking page. It's not as busy. It's not as you know much detail. What you're left with is a simple image of St. Luke who is being depicted really as a monk in a way, like riding in a scriptorium. 
So basically you're seeing St. Luke writing the gospel, his gospel, his chapter in the New Testament. And so he's there sitting on a stool like with a pillow cover to it, his feet raised up on a platform. And notice in that platform where his feet are raised or like a stool, the perspective is goofy, <laughs> like it's definitely off. It gets wider as it goes back. And that's not how it should really be. It should get more narrow, but the lines are wider. So perspective is not important to our Christian artist. If you notice his drapery, the folds are only defined by lines now and a pattern. There's no modeling in our figure anymore. He's a relatively flat figure with these exaggerated like lines to really suggest the folds of the drapery. But it no longer really showcases the body so much. Perspective is off. It's, it's this new, abstracted, non-realistic kind of way to depict human figures. Because again, naturalism isn't what's important here. It's important to know the story, know the message, know the symbolism, you know, and to feel the effect of that in your faith and nothing more. And so above him and you know, behind his head is this flat halo to suggest his divinity. And then directly above him is his symbol. Each of the evangelists, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, have a symbol to represent them. And so Luke's symbol is a calf with wings. Uh, and this typically is associated with Christ, so with Jesus, and his execution or his crucifixion. And the calf there is holding what looks like just a flat rectangle, but that's supposed to be St. Luke's gospel, the chapter he wrote for the New Testament. And his name is written there. You can see Lucas. They're written in Latin on uh, in the text. No setting, no, like, you know, you have very little idea of a time or place and that's typical really in Byzantine art and in the Middle Ages. You want your images to look timeless. No time, no place. The message exists in all eternity. And that's definitely what we have here going on. He looks a little um, thoughtful, or you can even say like, not worried, but He's trying so desperately hard, I feel like, to get down the word exactly as it should be, to do a good job. So that, again, is the St. Luke portrait page, called the portrait page because it is an image of St. Luke. Now, the last image you guys have to know for this particular book is called the St. Luke insipit page. So insipit would be a vocab term here, and it translates to it begins. So really, this would be the beginning of the Gospel of St. Luke, almost like those fairy tale, like if you watch a movie or, or a book on fairy tales that's very ornamental on its you know, writing, you'll have a big letter that starts off like the big O for once upon a time. It's the same idea here, where you have a big Latin letter to start off the text of the Gospel. And so you have the Latin writing, and then you have mixed within this beginnings of St. Luke's gospel, you have all the intertwining again. Instead of a lot of snakes this time, if you look around, you'll start to see birds and cats. So we have different animals here. We have intertwining kind of stylized bodies. And once again, pattern, dots around the letters to make them stand out but also to give you kind of this meditative, um, kind of transformative experience as you read and contemplate the word of St. Luke, which ultimately is the word of God. So those are a look at your three pages. And the one last thing that I forgot to tell you, and then I'll get into formal quality and function, if you can go back down to um, context, if you could make sure you are writing, and, and if you look back at the um, 
era, it will say Hiberno-Saxon. Uh, Hiberno-Saxon basically is uh, works of art produced in the British Isles. So Ireland, Scotland, England, during around you know, this time period in the Middle Ages of our art timeline. So Hiberno-Saxon, Hibernia is basically Ireland, Saxon has to do with England and, and Scotland. So it's art from that area. So I just wanted to make sure you knew what that meant. And you can put that in context. So ultimately, I would say for this particular piece for function, it would definitely be religion and didactic. Religious art and didactic art. You know, instructional, that's what that didactic means. Uh, it is definitely showing power because of the materials. You know, this is a luxury item, but it's the power of the word of God, the power of the message and the, the faith, not necessarily power of any particular person. And then for formal qualities, uh, you could do the color. You know, the color is very bold, and a lot of that pigment color is achieved from materials that are very exotic and luxurious. You could do also, besides color, you could do pattern. And the pattern, that very, very intertwining, we can almost use the term, especially with the, the carpet page, if you remember the term we went over called horror vacui, that fear of empty spaces. So that really full intertwining spiraling pattern of animals and, and things just helps to get one into this meditative prayer, uh, praying mindset. Uh, so that again is the Lindus Farn Gospels, uh, another illuminated manuscript, a great illuminated manuscript we see in the Middle Ages.